Good afternoon. And I'd first like to take this opportunity to be the first teenager ever to thank Milton for the internet. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> As you already know, uh, my name is Lucas Simone, and I'm a student at West Town School. I'm also someone who's inspired by things that bridge disciplines. I often ask questions like, what happens when you mix comparative literature with city planning or education with technology? Now, although I really enjoy this conference, I think my favorite interdisciplinary gray area is the meeting of art and engineering and the products you receive when you combine elements from both. Throughout my study of these subjects, I've utilized technology that's not normally found in the classroom, technology that has broadened my thinking, presented its own challenges to attack, and will hopefully be a game changer for my future. I have always been interested in both art and engineering, but I've always kept them somewhat separate in my head. As a kid, I was always dragged along to art galleries where it seemed like people stood around and stared at walls for way too long and I subscribed to an unhealthy amount of car magazines for someone to read within a month. <sighs> Here it goes. Um, but in sixth or seventh grade, I saw something that really connected the dots for me. It was a TED talk, nothing like this one, that was given by a Dutch sculptor named Theo Jansen. And he described one of his projects um, to have made a new life form called a strand beast. So this is a strand beast, and it's made out of PVC piping. And they're powered by the wind. And that wind power compresses the air into plastic bottles, which then drives pistons to actuate a leg mechanism. An interesting thing about these, besides the fact that they're ridiculous looking, um, <laughs> is that they were first created to maintain the dunes along the Dutch coast. Now, this is, um, the, these strand beasts are only possible with Theo Jansen's 11 holy numbers, um, which basically describe the ratio of triangles that make the mechanism work. Now, although this is quite pretentious and godlike, I guess you could say, I wasn't quite convinced that they were a new life form, but I was inspired by the way they move and thought that one day it would be an interesting design challenge to build. It also made me realize that art does not necessarily have to be made with a paintbrush or a chisel or a guitar, but can be made with some of the more sophisticated tools of the maker world of today, such as a 3D printer or a CNC machine. Now, by my sophomore year of high school, I was feeling that my creativity was going stale. I opened up to my mom. She's sitting right there. Say hello. And I said, Mom, I feel like I'm not as creative as I used to be. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, I don't make mud paintings in the driveway like I used to. And I don't build drum kits out of all the pots and pans in the kitchen. Um, and she said, well, I'm glad you don't do that because <laughs> I think you've outgrown that. And I'm glad that all my pots and pans are safe and sound in their cupboards. But I was still missing this, this creative drive. To my rescue came a West Town class called Design and Engineering, which basically challenges kids to come up with their own ideas, seek fundraising for those ideas, and then go about designing and building them out. My project, of course, was to build a strand bead. So I started this project by walking up a hierarchy of materials. First came cardboard cutouts. It looked like this, but basically just allowed me to get a sense of the mechanism. Then came laser cut wood, and then onto PVC and zip ties, a stage of the project that I spent entirely too much time on, and probably just because I wanted to feel like I accomplished something. This stage of the project also made me realize that I needed to differentiate 
differentiate what I was doing from Theo Jansen's work. So I rebranded it and called my project Grazer and switched from PVC to box aluminum. At this point, design and engineering was coming to a close and I hadn't even really started my real project. So to my rescue again came West Town's independent seminar class, a class that basically is there for kids with a passion to take a deeper dive into whatever they want to study. It's very student motivated and self-driven. Um, so with box aluminum singled out as my material of choice, that's it, um, I realized that I needed a way to connect all the parts or else it would just be a pile of sticks on the floor and that wouldn't be very interesting at all. So I set about learning how to use my school's new CNC machine to mill custom aluminum joints. Um, for any of you who don't know what a CNC machine is, CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, and it basically works in the same way that a 3D printer would, um, like that brilliant young kid was describing in Milton's video, um, in the sense that it cuts, part, it cuts parts using X, Y, and Z coordinates. But where a CD, CNC printer um, uses additive manufacturing, where it starts with nothing and then adds layers to get to a part, um, CNC manufacturing is subtractive, where you start with a block of stock and then cut around that to get your part. Now to do this, you first need to design an object or a part in um, a piece of CAD software, such as Autodesk Fusion 360, which is the one that I use, um, or Rhino 3D, which is another popular one. And then um, that program will spit out uh, code for the machine to interpret. So in theory, this would allow for me to replicate the hundreds of joints I would need to build my strand, or build my grazer, excuse me, down to a thousandth of an inch of accuracy with relative ease. Sounds simple enough, but however, that did not end up being the case. The first few attempts ended up in a mangled piece of stock that was torn out of the vise by a frustrated and angry CNC machine. And I often compare the CNC machine to a blind and deaf heart surgeon, critically precise, but it wouldn't know if someone sneezed into the patient's open heart cavity. Um, to remedy this, I milled two pieces of aluminum that would sandwich the main stock in the vise. There would be another part alongside of that um, to hold the part or to hold the piece of stock really tight in the vise. And I ran the program one more time, and what I got back was my first functioning part. Um, since then, I've refined the design um, into various different joints and I settled with a simple handshake joint, which basically has one part interfacing with the, an identical part, um, simplifying re production and uh, reducing friction. So 16 weeks have gone by, and that's pretty much all I have. And I feel like I hadn't really made that much progress. I asked myself if my relationship with technology has strengthened, or if my initial goal to gain greater insight into an interdisciplinary space between art and engineering had deepened, or if I'd just been betrayed by the technology that I thought was so reliable. But it does get better. Recently, I figured out some of the relationship issues I was having with the CNC machine, or the CNC, CNC machine was having with me, probably both. Um, and I started milling parts. As I became more fluid with the machining process, those parts started coming out faster and faster, and then started connecting to longer parts. And finally, I was making progress. That progress gave me motivation to keep going, and also made me realize, and as, as, sorry, as um, my artistic vision started turning into tangible objects. That's when I realized that art and engineering operate within very different bounds. One is free form and unrestricted. The other requires very tight tolerances. When you integrate engineering into art, 
you end up with something that can do more than a traditional piece. It's more dynamic and can interact with the viewer. It starts a conversation of actions, is more relatable, and can leave a longer lasting impression. The difficult part is making sure that the confines of engineering do not interfere with the artistic vision. So you have to keep them in a very close balance, and this project is trying hard to find that balance. Today, I have a fully functioning leg. It's one thing to see your vision and, and have it be manifested by at most just a few pieces of mangled aluminum, but it's another thing to see what you've created and to know just how much time and energy went into it. I know it doesn't look like much, just a couple pieces of aluminum screwed together, but it's proof to me that the grazer will one day walk, and I just hope it doesn't trip. Thank you very much. <laughs>